I am an intensivist. I work in one of the hospital environments where there is mostly technology and high-tech treatments. That's how people usually think about intensive care. But intensive care units are mainly about people. The relationship between all these people in the ICU are so important. Uh, the dynamics of the team, but more importantly, the relationship that we build with the patient and the family. Sono rimasto particolarmente colpito dalla, eh, dal, dal pronto intervento ogni volta che avevo necessità sia a livello fisico che psicologico. Il personale interveniva sempre con molta affabilità, quindi molto gentilmente. Mi sentivo veramente accudito e protetto in ogni momento eh, della giornata. Quindi da questo punto di vista eh, sono rimasto molto, molto soddisfatto. Venivo inoltre informato eh, su quegli aspetti eh, clinici che avrei dovuto subire da quel momento in poi. Quindi mi, mi veniva spiegato nei dettagli cosa avrebbero fatto e come lo avrebbero fatto. Al momento del risveglio non avevo ovviamente le idee molto chiare. Eh, stavo vivendo due realtà eh, diverse. Una, quella vera, eh, in rianimazione, e un'altra che eh, era quella degli incubi, per cui mh, il primo periodo non avevo ancora capito bene eh, quale delle due era vera. Solamente dopo aver parlato ripetutamente con i medici che mi rassicuravano e mi spiegavano appunto questo fenomeno degli incubi, e soprattutto anche dopo aver parlato con mia moglie al telefono, ho capito qual era la vera realtà. Le due realtà erano vissute ambedue dentro il reparto, quindi per me era difficile distinguere. L'ingresso di mia moglie in terapia intensiva è stata una inaspettata e piacevole sorpresa. Non ricordo molto di quel, di quel momento, le parole soprattutto, però ricordo benissimo le sensazioni e, e lo sguardo di mia moglie. La terapia intensiva è un'esperienza sicuramente molto dura e viene vissuta eh, probabilmente in modo diverso da ognuno di noi base al proprio carattere. Il messaggio che posso mandare è un messaggio di fiducia e di speranza, in quanto eh, dobbiamo eh, totalmente metterci nelle mani del personale sanitario che ha la formazione corretta per gestire soprattutto gli aspetti, oltre che quelli clinici, anche gli aspetti emotivi della persona e quindi psicologici, che sono, secondo me, forse per il paziente e la famiglia, gli aspetti più importanti. You are the spouse, you are the brother, the sister, the parents, the children of an ICU patient. You are a friend. All of you are family members. Of course, we are not going to have the same communication with any of you according to what's the relationship between you and the patient. But we are concerned by how you are doing, whoever you are, and whatever is the, your relation with uh, the patient. The team uh, was so human and kind. They helped me psychologically every day. I was waiting for the call every day with um, impatient. So um, that period was really, really very hard for my family. The team of ICU became really, really my family. I felt them closer even than my parents. Every day someone from the team called me and informed me about the situation of my husband and the next steps to do. And uh, I want to say that even if I was far from my husband, I have been always updated about his clinical situation. And uh, when there were very important decisions to make, for example, like tracheomy, they called me four, five times per day. So I want to say thank you. For me, it was a new experience, uh, like for many other people. I have never faced ICU. So after this experience, I changed my life. I changed all points of view. It was a really very hard peri period, and uh, I was about to lose my husband, but I have never lost uh, hope and I tried to be strong a uh, ration. I remember my first visit in ICU very well because it's impossible to forget. It was so emotional. After 64 days, finally, I could see my husband, touch his hands, see his eyes. It was really very, very, very difficult to live uh, without him and uh, without personal contact. I don't have enough words to say 
thank you to the doctors for that possibility that uh, they permitted me to visit him in ICU. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to say to, to the future patients and uh, their families that they should trust to the staff of ICU. They are loved in the hands of professionals that uh, work tirelessly with patient and love. They are always with the patients. The patients are the primary focus for them. They always gave the warm care and necessary treatment. They never leave alone patients. They are always with them and ready to help them in any moment. The patients are the primary focus for the staff. In the end, I want to say, no matter how ill the patient, don't give up hope. Having a loved one in the ICU can be an extremely distressing experience. Some family me members suffer from symptoms of anxiety, of depression, some feel lost or even disorientated. So don't forget to take care of yourself. Sometimes you will need to take a break. You don't have to stay with the patient 24 hours a day and you mustn't feel guilty if you do need to take that break. Don't forget that the ICU team will continue to care for the patient while you're not there and they will always call you if there is a change in his, his or her condition. My name is Silvia. I'm a critical care nurse. I work in an intensive care unit. My work is to assist the doctor and to help them to prepare the patient to get all the medicines and the treatments they need in the ICU. When the family first enters an intensive care unit, I will receive them and welcome them and present them the room and the patient and explain the condition of the relative. I will be there to receive also their emotions, how they are feeling about it, and explain them what the patient is feeling at the moment, what we are going to give them for treatment. We will be there in any case to help them to go through these days in the intensive care unit and to perceive and to communicate with the patient. We will be there to help him and assist him to the toilet, to the feeding, and to do anything that the patient will not be able to do. But moreover, we also will be there to see how is he feeling, if it's uncomfortable, if it's in pain, to learn to communicate with him all over the stay with all the equipment he will have. We will explain them the things that will happen to him and to his family and to interact between the doctors and the patient. The main role of a physiotherapist is the rehabilitation of the patient. With the term rehabilitation, we mean uh, restore the previous situation that uh, the patient had uh, uh, before uh, his or her injury, his or her uh, trauma. And so uh, the patient could uh, have uh, again his or her previously autonomy in the best way it uh, could be possible. A physiotherapist could work uh, inside the intensive care unit, so it is uh, a member of uh, ICU team for all his or her uh, working time, while in other countries the physiotherapist comes to ICU just uh, only for the rehabilitation moment. Hello, my name is Stefan Schaller. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist. As a medical doctor at the ICU, I'm part of the healthcare team taking care for patients. My role is to coordinate the healthcare team to do the diagnosis and the treatment of the patient. To you, as a family member, I have to explain what is going on with your family member in the ICU. I explain to you what we are doing for diagnosis. I tell you the options for treatment and how to treat the patient. Very often, we have to discuss what are the wishes of your relatives, although he's not responsive. Therefore, we discuss together with you what is the best care we could provide for your relative. In the beginning of your ICU treatment, very commonly, you are unresponsive. You will be examined by me or a colleague every day. We will make the diagnosis plan and the treatment plan. Later on, when you are waking up again, we are starting to talk with you about the treatment plan as well. While you are unresponsive, 
we try to discuss the care with your family or we look at any documentation you provided, how the care should provide it for you. As a social worker, I'm part of the ICU team. I regularly come on a daily basis to the ICU and talk with the professionals uh, on issues with the families or with the patients. For example, when it's about communication or when there are conflicts, but also when the families have a request so that I can help them to overcome that issue. What I notice is that the families uh, have a really difficult time. They are stressed about their loved one, but they also have, uh, for example, issues for themselves. For example, they have questions, can I take my children into the ICU? Or how can I manage uh, the homework? Or what can I do about financial problems? So I try to help them with that kind of issues. And sometimes they are also asking uh, life questions. Because, for example, why is this happening to me or to us? And what's the meaning of this, that he or she is going to have this critical illness? So I try to help them with this kind of issues. My relationship with the patient is to get him or her uh, to learn him better. And it, I think it's very important to have the values, what is important for the patient, to have them um, bring into the care that we provide in the ICU. And I think that it is uh, compassionate care, humanizing care, and that is combined with the highest technical and medical treatment that we provide. And in that way, we have uh, excellent care that we can provide in the ICU. And I try to, to, to bring my expertise and to have the patient and his meanings and his opinions uh, in front of it. A special aspect in my daily practice is the communication, the communication with the patient and the communication with the families. Communication in ICU is very difficult because the clinical situation is very complex and sometimes it's not so easy to explain to families. And in my opinion, the most important thing is to try to keep it very simple, not to spend a lot of technical words, but I just only try to explain uh, the clinical status with uh, simple words. It's very important to try to develop uh, a relationship uh, with the patient and try to keep it quiet, uh, to tell him that uh, the situation um, is under control. Uh, it's very important to maintain a patient uh, calm and confident with the team because very often the patients are very scared by the, uh, by the environment of the ICU. So it's very, very important to, to guarantee the comfort of the patient. We work together as a single team with patients and families, and that's crucial for the recovery of our ICU patients. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, a warm welcome to everybody. Today is the webinar, the elderly patient in the intensive care unit by the Health Services Research and Outcomes section. My name is Christian Jung from Düsseldorf, Germany, and I have the honor to chair the section and the webinar today. We have the privilege to have two excellent speakers who will give the presentation together. And let me shortly introduce the speakers. Susanna Lever, trained in medicine at the University of London, 
She completed her PhD thesis in 2011, looking into inflammatory response to sepsis. And she has been an ICU consultant and at St. George's Hospital since 2013. In addition to intensive care medicine, she trained in respiratory and general medicine and maintains a broad interest in the interface between these specialities. She is directorate lead for critical care research at St. George's Hospital, and she's part of the very old intensive care patient network and country coordinator for the UK. And we are very happy to have you here today, Susanna. But in addition, we have here today Professor Bertrand Guidet, and he's the director of the medical intensive care at the Hospital Saint Antoine in Paris, in France. In 1987, in 1987, he joined the medical intensive care board. He has been an university professor since 1997. He's the past president of the French Society of Intensive Care, and uh, Bertrand, Professor Guidet has written close to 400 articles and published a large number of very, very excellent articles. He worked on critical ill old patients since uh, 20 years and was the PI of several national and international studies. And also he works together with the French Ministry of Health on ICU organization at the national level. Before we start, I would like to motivate you to ask questions in the ESICM TV chat. They will direct it to me and we will be able to discuss uh, these questions after the presentation. And this presentation will be given together by both of you, Bertrand and Susanna. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introductions, Christian. Um, and Bertrand and I will be talking together on the elderly patient on intensive care. I just want to start by saying that neither Bertrand or I have any conflicts of interest to declare. So I'm going to start by um, going back to an interactive session that was performed by Hans Flutten and um, Bertrand in October 2019 at the ESICM conference in Berlin. The first question that was asked was, the number of very old patients in our intensive care unit will increase from around 15% to nearly 30% by 2014, putting a huge demand for increase in ICU beds. Do you think your ICU will be able to meet this challenge? And as you can see that most people felt not at all or only to a moderate degree. The second question was, if the number of ICU beds in your ICU or country will not be substantially increased, how do you think we may solve this challenge? So nobody thought that we should give priority to these elderly patients. Um, some people felt that we should have dedicated intermediate units, but the majority of people felt that we needed better pre-ICU triage for these patients. The final question I'm going to talk about is, if we could select a patient better before ICU admission, what is the most important information to use in this process? And people felt that patients' wishes and a degree of frailty were the most important. So here we've shown that um, a lot of people feel that um, we're going to struggle with um, increasing ICU patients in the elderly population. That we all feel that um, free triage is very important, as are patients' wishes and looking at the degree of frailty. So who should we admit to our ICUs? If we admit absolutely everybody, it would be futile because we'd be admitting people that we don't expect to benefit. If we um, underutilize it and don't admit these elderly patients, we'll be denying treatment to patients who we feel have a good chance of recovery and will be at risk of being called ageist. And we've got to be careful about our patient selection because we don't want to admit the wrong patients and then have readmissions later on. So this is a, traje a patient trajectory in, in the elderly patients. If you start at the bottom here, you can see there's a large number of critically ill elderly patients. And of those, a, a, a fewer patients get admitted to ITU. So here at A, there is already pre-triage, pre-ITU. Of these patients admitted to ITU, a number of them die, B, and um, so fewer are alive at ITU discharge, fewer are alive at hospital discharge, fewer are alive at one year, and only a small minority at the top have a good recovery. So we need to be looking pre-ITU at who we admit, 
we need to take care of looking after these patients in ITU, but also on discharging these patients, we need to give them the best possible chance to reach this good recovery at the top. This is a review called Caring for the Critically Ill Patients Over 80. I'm not going to go through it now, but it's an excellent review if you want to read it at your leisure at another time. I also want to look at this European survey, and it was looking at the attitudes of physicians towards critically ill elderly patients. It was from 20 European countries and 162 ICUs. And as you can see, 37% of people felt there was no clear evidence of ICU benefit in these elderly patients. 97% felt that we should be looking at patient advanced directives. 83% felt we should be asking relatives opinions. 79% wanted guidelines. A large number, 92% felt that a frailty assessment was absolutely mandatory. 91% felt that we should systematically reassess the patients at day two or three, so give them a trial of ITU. And about two thirds of patients felt that consulting a geriatrician would be useful. So Bertrand and I are going to answer these seven questions and I'll hand over to Bertrand now. Thank you, Susanna. So the first question is about um, patient and family wishes. Uh, uh, here we asked emergency physicians in blue and uh, uh, ICU physician in red, what they consider the most important factors for proposing an ICU uh, uh, admission for an old patient for emergency physician or for accepting an old patient for uh, intensive care physician. And as you can see, number four is patient wishes. Um, it's number four for emergency physician, and it's even number two for uh, ICU physician. So it means that we really need to ask, if possible, uh, about the patient wishes. As a matter of fact, we, we looked in real life, uh, what is our practice? In this first prospective uh, French multi-center study, we had uh, something like 2,600 patients, and among them, 2,100 were able to ask about their wishes. And as you can see, they were asked about their opinion in only 13% of the cases. And in the left part of the slide, you see the determinant of asking or not asking uh, to a patient. When the patient is older, you ask less, when he is living in a nursing home, you ask less. When he has a diagnosis of dementia or chronic neurological disease, you ask less. While he is, he, if he has a full uh, functional status, full autonomy, you ask much more. When you're an older physician, senior versus ju junior, you ask uh, less. It's a kind of paternalistic approach and uh, uh, the, the first message is that we are missing certainly a lot of opportunities to ask the patient about his wishes to be admitted or not in ICU. Uh, previous uh, slide. In this uh, study, 100 old patients uh, were asked about their wishes there were uh, shown short videos about what is intensive care about and asking those old patients whether they want or don't want to be treated with such treatment. Uh, when you look at non-invasive mechanical ventilation in the, in the bottom, you see that about two thirds are okay to be treated with non-invasive mechanical ventilation. But when you show what is Invasive mechanical ventilation, you have about a half half about acceptance and refusal. And the third case was you're already under invasive mechanical ventilation, and then you need to be treated with renal replacement therapy. And you can see that about two thirds refuse to be treated by renal replacement therapy. When you ask the same question to physicians, usually the physicians are much more aggressive in their proposal for treatment. So the first message for this part is that we are a missing opportunity to ask the patient about his wishes. And when you ask the patient, in most of the cases, you want a less aggressive treatment than the one proposed by ICU physician. 
Susanna? Thank you. So I'm going to now talk about how to assess a critically ill patient and what predictors we can use in these very old patients. So frailty is an increased state of vulnerability from age-related decline in physiological reserve and function. And as you can see here on this Venn, oh, on this Venn diagram, um, frailty is um, associated with geriatric symptoms such as cognitive impairment and dementia on the left and sarcopenia on the right. But importantly, not every old patient is frail. Now this depicts a fit and a frail patient and the impacts of acute stress. Now, if you look on the left hand side here at the top, you've got the fit elderly patient and there's a scale of reserve capacities on the one hand and frailty on the other hand. And frailty is depicted by alterations in functional autonomy, comorbidities and physi physiological age. And you can see this patient is pretty well balanced at baseline. Now they have an acute stress and they go down to the bottom here on the left. And you can see that the, the scale becomes the patient deteriorates and become a bit off kilter. However, this patient has the reserve capacity to get back to their baseline from this stress. However, if we look at this top paper on the right here, this is a frail elderly patient who has quite a significant amount of frailty, um, balanced out by a reduced reserve capacity. And they are just about coping at baseline. However, they have the same acute stress, but this same stress causes such a much more profound deterioration in this patient. They don't have the, reverse, the reserve capacity to cope with it, and therefore they do not get back to baseline and may um, die from this. So what is important to stress here is that with the fit and the elderly patient, they have very different outcome from the same acute stress. So what do we want from a geriatric tool when we're assessing these patients? It needs to be easy to collect because a lot of our patients are very sick at the time of collecting them, collecting the data. It needs to be simple so that we don't have missing data, but we want it to be accurate. It needs to have good reproduci reproducibility so that we can, um, when different people are using it, we get the same results. And it needs to give us information about prognostication in our patients, both in the short term and in the long term. Now, there are a number of clinical frail of frailty um, scores out there, but I think the clinical frailty scale is probably the one that's most commonly used in intensive care units. And it was proposed by Rockwood and all in um, 2008 from the Canadian study on health and aging. And what it is, is, is nine different classes, so nine different groups, um, going from the very fit at one to the terminally ill at nine. So one, two, and three are determined as being fit. Four is vulnerable or pre-frail. Frail. Then five, six, seven, and eight are increasing um, severity of frailty, and nine is terminally ill. And what Rockwood showed is with increasing, um, increasing on this scale, so increasing frailty, patients that are a year or more likely to have had a fall, be institutionalized or have increased morbidity. So the VIP1 study looked at the impact of frailty on both ICU and 30 day mortality in the very old patients, which is defined as patients over the age of 80 years old. And these patients were both elective and acute patients. There were more, far, more than 5,000 patients recruited from 20 different countries and 311 ICUs. And this um, map here shows um, which um, countries were involved and how many numbers were, were, came from each country. And what they found we found here is on the left, you've got um, patients on the y-axis. On the right on the y-axis, you've got mortality. And on the x-axis, you've got increasing levels of frailty. And the elective patients are depicted in black and the acute admissions in blue. And as you can see, there is a fairly um, broad um, degree of frailty among these patients. And in fact, 43% of them were deemed frail, having a clinical frailty score of five or above. So if you look at the elective admissions, there is some increase in um, mortality with increasing frailty. However, I think the, the most important thing from this graph is you can see an almost linear relationship among the acute admissions with increasing mortality associated with increasing frailty. And then if we look at the multivariate analysis to see what um, predicts um, the mortality in these patients, um, clinical frailty scale does, so the degree of frailty, age does, increasing severity of illness, depicted by the SOFA score, and also, I suppose, as you would expect, urgent um, patients or emergency patients um, did worse than the elective um, counterparts. So then we come on to the VIP2 study, 
And this looked at four different geriatric um, tools. So the looked at the contribution of frailty assessed by the clinical frailty scale, cognition by the IQ code questionnaire, activities of daily living by the CATS um, ADL question, um, questionnaire, and comorbidities with the CPS, the comorbidity and polypharmacy score. And this time, this um, was just in acutely admitted patients, but again, in patients over the age of 80, admitted into European ICUs. There were almost 4,000 patients for 242 ICUs and 22 countries. Now, this is a principal component analysis, and it's used to show associations between the geriatric and severity variables. And the smaller the, um, so the, smaller the angle, so the closer together that the, um, the lines are, the best they correlate. So you can show here there's good correlation between the clinical frailty score, the activities of daily living, which is the disability, and cognition by the IQ code. And these are the results of the four different scales. So on the top left, you've got the clinical frailty scale. And on the y-axis, you've got overall um, survival probability with days after ICU admission on the x-axis. Now, the light green colour depicts um, the fit patient, the purple, the vulnerable patient, and the red, the frail, the frail patient. And as you can see, the um, fit patients have a better survival than the frail patients. So if I move over to the right, the activities of daily living, which depicts the disability, Again, you can see the top two lines, the um, purple and the red, did much better than the patients who were more disabled in the green line. And the bottom left, the cognition, and we use an IQ code of more than 3.5 to show severe cognitive decline. And the patients in red had a worse survival than those with better cognition. But we showed no effect from the, co the um, comorbidity and polypharmacy score seen here in the bottom right-hand corner. So again, looking at multivariate analysis, the things that were associated with um, increased mortality was um, severity of illness depicted by the SOFA score and again frailty with the clinical frailty score. And we also produced a model looking at all the different geriatric tools together and showed that actually the clinical frailty scale used, was just as good on its own as it was with, um, with the others put together. So it was independently associated with mortality. So the clinical fraud scale is useful, but how reliable is it? So in the VIP2 paper, we had um, 1,923 patients who had two raters rating their clinical frailty. And you can see the distribution of those raters here. They were ICU nurses, ICU physicians, and research um, staff. And what this showed is there was excellent um, high inter-rater agreement between the different um, raters with a weighted kappa score of 0.86. So not only is the clinical frailty score useful to use, it also has good reliability as well. Thank you, Susanna. So the third question is about admission uh, to uh, uh, intensive care. So uh, in fact, there is no guideline uh, specifically designed to address the question of admission of old critically ill patients in intensive care. So there is a list uh, issued by the Society of Critical Care Medicine in, in the US, but it's, it is pretty old and it is not uh, specifically designed for all patients. So with this list, we adapt uh, the list and we ask to emergency physician about the factors that the consider to propose a patient for ICU admission. And um, through this uh, Delphi process, at the end of the process, we had some definitive criteria, that is, there was a good consensus among emergency physicians, while for other criteria, it, it was more equivocal. So we were expecting that patients with definitive criteria will be proposed for an ICU admission by emergency uh, physicians. This is in fact absolutely not the case. You can see that among the patients with definitive admission criteria, about only a third were proposed for an ICU admission. And among those patients, only one out of two were finally admitted uh, in, in the ICU. So I think it is an important piece of information because there is a pre-selection process, a pre-triage occurring before ICU and so it means that we really need to work with colleagues in the emergency physician, but also 
in uh, um, in different uh, wards in the in the hospital. Second, uh, we, we found that in this study, there was no beneficial effect of being admitted in ICU. And even if you adjust for several factors, the mortality, or I mean the survival was lower among the patients admitted in ICU. The problem is that among the patients not admitted in ICU, you have a very heterogeneous population. Some patients are in fact too sick to be admitted in ICU, but you have some patients that were considered to be too well to be admitted to ICU. So it is very difficult from this prospective study, but without randomization, to have a final uh, uh, opinion about the benefits of being admitted in ICU. What we found uh, is that we were able to uh, identify poor uh, six months uh, prognosis, uh, age was uh, one independent factor, while a preserved functional status uh, was uh, protective, having an active cancer was, was bad, and to be uh, cachectic or uh, somewhat uh, malnourished was, was bad. So according to those factors, we designed a, a prospective randomized, cluster randomized study to assess whether a systematic proposal for ICU admission of an, of an old critically ill patient will translate into a better six months survival. So this was a, a cluster randomized study, some hospital where as usual, there was no specific recommendation, kind of startup care arm, while for the other arm, there should be discussion between emergency physician and ICU physician and to try to involve the patient and the family members as much as possible. So the primary endpoint of this study was six months mortality and there was some secondary endpoint. At the end of the process, 24 hospitals uh, participated and we have something like 1,500 patients per hour. The patients that were included were very old. You see 85 median age with quite a lot of comorbidities. When you look at the, uh, the triage process in the systematic strategy arm, the patients were much more often asked about his wishes compared to the control arm. Control arm is very similar to our previous study. So uh, we are able to increase the number of patients that were asked. And when you ask the patient, some of them are favorable for an ICU admission, but some of them are unfavorable. So it means that really we need, if possible, to ask the patient about his or her wishes. Here is the main result of this study. You compare the systematic strategy arm and the standard strategy arm, when you look at the percentage of patients that were ultimately admitted in ICU, 61% in the systematic strategy, while it was 34 in the standard arm, a highly significant uh, difference. But when you look at the mortality, the six months mortality, which was the primary endpoint, the six months mortality was in fact higher in the systematic uh, strategy arm compared to the standard strategy. But the patients here were more severe according to SAP3. When you adjust for several factors, including SAP3, then there is no uh, difference in mortality, but there is absolutely no signal that by pushing ICU admission, it will translate into a lower mortality at six months. When you look at qualitative outcome at six months, you can see that there is a decrease in functional status uh, in uh, uh, about two thirds of the patient. And uh, this difference is not uh, uh, significant between the two arms. And when you look at the quality of life assessed by, by SF12, the physical component is, sim is similar. The mental component is a little bit better in this arm. And when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, there is absolutely no difference between the two. So we, we published this study in, in JAMA about four years ago. And uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, 
pushing very hard to have more uh, patients admitted uh, in ICU is not able to decrease mortality. It does not say that you should not uh, admit all patients in ICU since in the control arm, 34% of the patients were admitted. What about uh, life sustaining treatment? This is Susanna. Thank you, Bertrand. So we're just going to have a look at life sustaining treatment. Um, and this is a French study um, by Bertrand. And what they did is they looked at 3,175 patients aged 80 and above who were admitted to intensive care. And they compared them to a matched cohort of patients aged 65 to 79. And then they looked at what treatment these patients received. And as you can see, the old, old patients, so the ones aged 80 and above, received less mechanical ventilation, less renal support, and few of them had tracheostomies. So perhaps suggesting that the treatment was being withheld in some of these patients. Oh, I seem to have lost control here. One second. OK, so in the um, VIP1 study, we looked at withholding and withdrawing patients in this age group in the above 80s. So if you remember from the VIP1 study, it was acutely and um, elective invasive patients. There were 5,000 and they were aged, aged over 80. And you can see here that in these patients, um, limitations of life-sustaining treatment was um, implemented in 27.2% of patients. 15% of patients had their treatment withheld and 12.2% of patients had their treatment withdrawn. And in the table below, you've got all patients here, no treatment limitation, withholding treatment alone and withdrawing and withholding treatment. And as you can see, the patients who had treatment withdrawn um, or withheld tended to be older. They tended to be more frail. They tended to be more sick with a higher SOFA score. And interestingly, the patients who had their treatment withheld had a length of stay of, of about three days. So they were getting treatment but we were making quick um, decisions about whether they were going to benefit from this treatment. And also, as you would expect, there were fewer patients who had their treatment withheld or withdrawn in the elective group. So what about the treatment that these patients received? So if you look at the top here, the non-invasive ventilation, there was more non-invasive ventilation in the withholding group, perhaps suggesting that these patients were having non-invasive ventilation as a ceiling of care. However, in the withdrawing group, patients did receive mechanical ventilation and they did receive um, vasoactive drugs in about 75% in each, showing that, that these patients were getting active treatment, but they were then having um, decisions about treatment, whether to continue treatment later in their, in their stay. There was also, as you would probably expect, an increase in frailty among those patients who had their treatment withheld and withdrawn. And then this is the um, IC mortality. So 22% in all of the patients, patients with no treatment limitation, 10.6%, 29% with patients withheld, and a higher percentage of 82% in those who withdrawn. And this is a death at 30 days. And I think it's important to point out here that in the patients who had their treatment withheld, almost 50% of them were alive at um, 30 days. So even though that um, they didn't receive full treatment, 50% of them were still alive. So what were the factors that were associated with us making these limitation of life sustaining treatment decisions? So it was associated with increased frailty, increased age. We're more likely to make um, these decisions in a uh, acutely or an emergency admission rather than elective admission, and also those who had an increased um, severity of illness. We also looked at the impact of religion. So on the y-axis here, you've got um, the standardized treatment limitation ratio, and on the x-axis, you've got increasing um, religious beliefs on um, going towards the right. And um, the religious belief was, it was how important people, they were asked, is God important? And what was interesting here was that in countries where they were more religious, they were more, less likely to implement these limitations of life-sustaining treatment. We also looked at the impact of um, GDP per capita and you've got the same y-axis and on the x-axis you've got increasing um, GDP per capita, so the richer countries towards the right. And again, interestingly, the countries that were um, at the higher GDP um, were more willing to um, implement um, limitations in life-sustaining treatments compared to those of the poorer countries. 
And we also saw that there was a, a difference in the demographics in that people were more likely to implement um, limitations in the northern um, European countries compared to the southern and eastern European countries. Thank you, Susanna. So what about uh, hospital trajectory and, and mortality? You have several uh, papers about that. The, this is a very simple uh, paper looking at in ICU mortality according to the age category here, according to the fact that you have no comorbidity or at least one comorbidity and medical uh, patient, surgical, uh, urgent surgery or scheduled surgery. So you can see, for example, that if you are uh, over uh, 80, the in ICU mortality could be something like five persons for planned surgery with no risk factor, while for medical patients with uh, uh, risk factor, the in ICU mortality is above 30%. Here in this systematic review, we looked at reported mortality in hospital in prospective multi-center study and you can see that the mortality range from 24% to 42%. And in multi-center retrospective study, you have about the same results between 20 and 43%. When you look at the factors that are reported for long-term mortality, you find that age is, is a, a factor for long-term mortality being a, a male, having comorbidities, a low functional status, being frail, type of admission, and, and factors at admission severity uh, score, Glasgow comma score, and having acute renal failure. And the organ support during the ICU stay to be mechanically ventilated, to have septic complication, and do not resuscitate order. So those are the factors that are important to consider for six months and one month uh, and one year mortality. This is a very uh, important piece of information. When you compare the mortality in hospital after ICU discharge, you see that this extra mortality that you should add to the in ICU mortality is roughly five persons for the patients below 80 while this mortality is more than 10% for the patients older than 80. So it means that you work a lot for a patient in the intensive care, you discharge the patient to the ward, and in the ward, the patient will die. So this is, this is a real issue. Maybe the patient is too frail, that is, it will not be able to cope with the uh, uh, aggression, it will not be resilient enough to recover from this insult. Maybe we discharge the patient too early because it doesn't have time to recover. And maybe we discharge the patient to the wrong uh, ward. And there are some evidence suggesting that discharging a patient to an acute geriatric unit is better than discharging the patient to um, a regular ward without expecti uh, expertise. In, in geriatric uh, matter. Uh, so, uh, so it is difficult to, to decide whether we should or not admit an old critical ill patient in ICU. So how to deal with uncertainty? And there are some uh, information about the time-limited trial. So uncertainty is, is pretty, uh, 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 frequent situation. It's two o'clock in the morning. You have to deal with a patient is in a acute respiratory uh, failure. You don't have all the information. You don't have the family members. You don't have access to the general practitioner. What do you do? You need to communicate with the patient. Uh, and if the family members are there, you need to communicate about this uncertainty and how you will deal with this uncertainty. What you could do is to admit a patient to the ICU, but you, you uh, uh, say uh, during this first uh, interview with the patient and the family that the, the um, situation will be um, uh, re-examined after a few days. And this will be a family conference with uh, the ICU team, with the family members, and maybe you can ask 
geriatrician to participate to this uh, family meeting. And uh, like this, you will have time to collect more information about patient background and wishes. You might be able to define better patient-centered uh, uh, goals to explore what family and caregivers hope and expect. And, uh, and you will have time to assess uh, how the patient responds to, uh, the, the, to the treatment. So in fact, it's a way of giving time to time and uh, to uh, be able to uh, adapt the treatment. At the end of this family meeting, you might decide to continue full code treatment without any limitation, or you might decide to withhold or withdraw uh, some treatment. And hopefully this proactive uh, uh, way of addressing this question might be able to reduce um, the burden for, for the family members and improve the, the team satisfaction and well-being. Susanna? Thank you, Bertrand. Um, and then we just want to talk about the burden that is put on, on the carers. So this is a sub-analysis of the ice cube 2 study um, done by um, Bertrand. And in two centres, they asked um, 191 relatives to complete a Zaret burden um, questionnaire. Now, this is a questionnaire with 22 items and it's out of 88. And a Zaret of less than 21 in, means a low burden. 21 to 40 a mild to moderate burden and above 40 a moderate to severe burden. And on the left hand side here you can see the percentage of the patients and in the dark blue you've got those that were admitted to ICU and in the light blue those that weren't admitted to ICU and you can see the burden was no difference of whether the patient was admitted to ICU or not. But about a third of the patients relatives did have significant burden put upon them from having a patient who had been critically ill and admitted to the hospital. And the things that were associated with um, an increased burden on the family were, um, were um, increasing disability, so loss of functional autonomy, um, looking at the ADLs, but also a lower um, mental health, um, health um, status. So I think it is important to think about the relatives um, when you're admitting a patient to um, intensive care and that they should be part of the conversations that we have with um, pre-ITU, if at all possible. So to conclude, uh, here are the list of um, questions and steps for uh, dealing with critically ill patients, to collect information about patients and relative wishes, to have uh, um, geriatric assessments, and you have some tools to, 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 to do it, and we are very much in favor of clinical frailty scale. You, you might define early goal of care, considering survival, but also um, uh, functional status and quality of life, expected quality of life in the long term. In case of uncertainty, you need to reassess the patient after a few days. You need to, um, to think about the hospital trajectory and how to work with a geriatrician uh, colleague and to consider burden for the family. So they have to be part of the decision-making process at the beginning. So uh, uh, you need to consider the patient prior to ICU, during the ICU stay, in the hospital, after the hospital. But it is the same for your caregivers because they have, in fact, uh, uh, to participate in, in, in the patient uh, treatment. So I'd like to, to acknowledge uh, all the participants of uh, the French uh, prospective studies and also the European studies. And, and uh, a big thanks to the uh, health service uh, research uh, and outcome uh, section of, of the society and, and to Christian uh, who, is, uh, who is there. So we're very active uh, for uh, promoting this common uh, view on uh, critically ill patients and uh, Ariane Boumendil, who performed the statistical analysis for all the published uh, studies. I really thank you for your attention and I will be very pleased with Susanna to answer your questions.
Thank you very much for this uh, nice overview. Uh, excellent uh, talk. Thank you very much. I would uh, like to invite the audience again to write uh, uh, questions to the chat and uh, uh, but we have already some and uh, maybe I would like to start with a question to uh, Bertrand um, from the chat. In your opinion, how should the patient assessment be conducted? Is there a risk of confusion between different opinions in emergency scenarios? And I would like to extend that question maybe with some recommendation how to deal with it. And you, you were talking about timings and when to take decisions. And I think it's really important to take these uh, things into consideration. Yes, thank you for the question. It's it, it's it's difficult because you need to consider several uh, factors. The first one is do you, do we have advanced directives? And we might discuss this. I'm pretty much against advanced directive, but I'm very much in favor of discussion among the family. Uh, what is your opinion about your life? What is your opinion about death? What would you like in case of deterioration of your health status? So I think this, this is a one piece of information which is very important. The second is uh, to, um, to share the decision-making uh, process, to share between physicians and to share it with uh, um, the patient if possible and the family members if, if they are there. And at, at the end of the process, if, if you have to deal with uncertainty, you don't know what to do, my proposal will be to admit the patient in intensive care, to perform intensive care treatment, and, and to reconsider after a few days uh, the level of care. Like this, you will be able to avoid um, uh, loss of chains, that is a patient is denied ICU treatment while it could, in fact, benefit from ICU treatment. Yeah, we have another question connected to that one is also a difficult one and an open one. What is the uh, evidence uh, based for a three day ICU trial as an example for a timing? No, no, you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, three days is, is uh, is a magic uh, uh, number because for some patients we need uh, one week or sometimes two weeks. For COVID patients, for example, it was very difficult. As you remember, we had some old patients and they were just uh, uh, the same day one and day eight. So there was no deterioration, but there was no improvement. So it was very difficult to, to, to decide to to withdraw uh, treatments uh, at, at day three. So there is no magic number. Uh, it really depends on, uh, on the patient situation and the uh, diagnosis. So for, certainly for cardiac arrest is different than for septic shock or different from a stroke, for example. So yes, I absolutely agree. Three days, it, it's, it's no, 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 no magic day. And, and, and again, uh, you, you organize a family conference and you might at the end of the family conference decide that we need to meet again in, 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 in three, four, four days or, or one week. So it's not a, a yes, no uh, decision. I would, I, said I would entirely agree with that. But I think also sometimes that um, the patient trajectory helps you in that you, you start treating a patient and they deteriorate despite what you're doing. But I do agree there's no, absolutely no magic number. Yeah, obviously we need more studies on, on, on this topic also. So, Susanna, I have a question for you from the chat. Uh, do you use any particular resources when explaining to patients what ICU involves or what ICU treatment means? I don't think we use any particular resources, but I would definitely go through um, exactly what um, they might encounter when they go to ITU, talk about intubation, talk about the different treatments we can give. And I would also very much say to them that um, 
that it, they might not benefit from ITU, but also that they may not go back to their baseline function and really just try and find out what their expectations are. Because I think a lot of people see the television programs where everyone does exceptionally well from ITU, everyone comes out with a back to their baseline function. And I think it's really important that both the family and the patient are well informed beforehand that this is unlikely to be the case. Yeah, uh, another question from the chat also to Susanna, maybe connected to this one. Should we focus on six months or one year functional outcomes rather than ICU or hospital survival? And this might also help then uh, patients to make uh, better decisions on their long-term health. Well, what do you think about what is the ultimate best uh, time point to look at? I do think that we would have a lot of benefit from looking at longer time points. Um, I, when I do IT follow-up clinic, I do find that you see patients who you were incredibly unwell at um, in ITU, didn't expect them to survive, and I'm often ha happily surprised by how well they've done. But I think a lot of them are still um, not back to baseline at six months, and I think a 12-month follow-up would be extremely useful. I think that would give us a lot more information about these patients. Mm. But it's very difficult to, to collect information, uh, follow up. Uh, some um, hospital have follow-up clinic where you can you can see the patient uh, after ICU discharge of six months or, or, or 12 months, but it's a lot of work. So you can do, you can do that. You might you might select the patient that you want to to to, to follow uh, on the long term. You're absolutely right, and I think that the attendance of follow-up will be biased as well, who attends and who doesn't. Yeah, correct. Bertrand, next question. Uh, well, what do you think about geriatric ICUs? Or maybe you can also, I would like to extend this question um, in maybe involvement of uh, specialists on geriatric medicine into ICU medicine. What's, what do you think about that? No, I, I'm not in favor of, of geriatric uh, ICU because it's a kind of ghetto uh, ICU for uh, all patients. But there is a specific expertise of geriatrician and there is um, some recommendation that should be revisited for all patients. Uh, we know that we need to be very cautious with some uh, medication, especially with uh, midazolam, for example, that provide a lot of delirium among uh, all patients. We know that some uh, guidelines are absolutely uh, not adjusted or tolerated for all patients. Do we need a mean arterial pressure of 65 for a patient who is 90 with a sick uh, artery? I, I, I don't know. The recommendation for weaning, are, are they the same when you have a, a, a no, no muscle uh, left, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, 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 I totally agree that we need geriatric expertise. We need to uh, perform specific studies dedicated to all patients. And we really need to work with geriatricians for maybe family conference to, to deal with difficult cases. And we really need to, uh, to work with geriatricians for the uh, post ICU care in order avoiding readmission in the hospital, uh, readmission in the ICU. So we will we don't have the expertise to do that. So the geriatrician will do that. And I have a project in my hospital with Hélène Vallée, a geriatrician I'm working with, to have a specific post-ICU ward for all patients discharged from the ICU. I would really support that as well because I think a lot of we work really hard on these patients in ITU and then we see a lot of mortality on the wards that they don't they don't discharge home and I think input from geriatricians would be really very useful at that point. Yeah great in general there are a lot of compliments for your talks but I would like to co uh, um, continue with also some very good questions and I would like to ask both of you, and we might start with uh, Susanna to report from your experience on a question that really differs across countries. And I also would like to thank uh, people from Africa watching, a colleague from Nigeria uh, asked the next question. And um, 
he asks, uh, how do you proceed as a physician if your assessment suggests that the patient will not benefit from ICU admission while the family insists on admission? We all know these patients from our daily practice. So, and it's not a general answer will not be possible. What, what are your thoughts, Susanna, about this difficult scenario? We see that often, and I agree, it's an incredibly difficult scenario. And the only way I go around it is sitting down with a family um, and, um, ask, and explaining exactly what um, ITU can achieve and what it can't achieve and look at their expectations. I also sometimes, if I can't speak to the patient, um, say, what would the patient say if they were sitting here? But I think sometimes <clears throat> they get in such a difficult situation that you end up having to admit these patients, but being very clear that you will give them a trial of ITU and that if um, they, um, don't, they don't thrive, that we'll be withdrawing at a certain point. But again, sometimes um, relatives are very unhappy with that. So I would then invite sometimes other intensivists for a second opinion um, to see whether they would agree with what I had suggested, often from another unit. There is an alternative, and I think we should think about it, is intermediate care unit or high dependency unit, as we say in the in UK. Uh, and I have some, some data suggesting that maybe for old patients and the intermediate care unit could be very useful and, and able to decrease mortality. And as part of RITU, we do have an HDU. So sometimes you can admit and say, well, we will try some NIV, and we will try, we will try maybe some low-dose vasopressors. Yeah. It is a very difficult scenario, and I don't think there's any correct answer at the moment for that. Or it is time-limited trial. That is, if you have enough empty uh, ICU bed, you admit the patient, but you, you, you said the family that there will be a, a, a discussion about the level of care after a few days. So you, 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 you set the, the, the scene, for a future uh, decision. Yes, I think that's a very wise strategy also. So uh, next question, uh, Bertrand, has the introduction of advanced care directives and similar instruments changed the pattern of frailty and critical care admissions um, at your institution, for example, or in general, what do you think? No, it's funny because everybody speak about advanced directive and nobody saw it. <laughs> <laughs> it's less than 2% of the patient with a written advanced directive. And we have some data suggesting that it does not really change the way the people are processing the admission decision process. So. Uh, again, uh, I think really we need to, to ask the patient and the family members about their wishes. I prefer this be because advanced directive is difficult. Sometimes it's not updated. You don't know exactly what it, what it is about. You don't know if the situation is um, uh, evaluated by the advanced directive. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not able to answer the question, but uh, I insist that we, we need to discuss with the, with the patient and the family members and to, to know the, the type of personality that they have and do they want to fight or, or not for, uh, for their life. So, so it's, 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 very, it's a difficult question. And uh, advanced directive, uh, a magic bullet, uh, I, I don't think so. You, you have to control each patient in, in, with the, his history, his, his culture, his wishes, et cetera. The only time I've ever seen an advanced directive which was incredibly useful was from someone who had been in intensive care before and they discussed it with their wife in advance and said, I do not want to be NG fed, I do not want to be intubated, I do not want non-invasive ventilation and it was very clear. And that's the only one that's ever been beneficial to me. A very specific question, Susanna. Um, from the chat. Uh, could you comment on the specific pathology of cardiac arrest in elderly patients with the objective, with objective criteria of dismal uh, prognosis? What do you think about this specific patient cohort of elderly patients? I think that's pretty much universally the elderly cardiac arrest patients do incredibly badly. 
Um, I don't know what people find elsewhere, but I find that they do, unless there is some quick um, arrhythmia, I think otherwise they do incredibly badly. Yeah, and some specific things on that you use in prognostication in elderly patients, or do you use the protocol also uh, applied in, in younger patients? We tend to use this, a similar protocol um, applied to younger patients. But I think often we need, should be making more pragmatic decisions right at the beginning. So I often there'll be a patient who's from a nursing home who's been in, in the accident and emergency department and being um, actively resuscitated for 40 minutes. I think sometimes we just need to be a bit more pragmatic at the beginning and think about what we're doing. But I haven't got any specific protocols for these patients. No, but no flow and low flow are, are very important for all patients. Uh, that is, we, we have a, a center dealing with cardiac arrest in Paris area, and they looked at specifically the old patients. So you need to consider the duration of no flow and low flow. Yeah, Bertrand, uh, 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 so some thoughts about the delay of uh, patients that they might experience in the emergency room before ICU admission. Are there some uh, specific things to uh, that apply for elderly patients? No, uh, we have very few data on that uh, from uh, ISCUB1 study have some data suggesting that a, a patient that is not admitted from the emergency uh, department who is uh, initially admitted in the ward and is deteriorating further in the ward and then you admit the patient after a few days, then the prognosis is very poor. So uh, I think you, you need to make the right decision in the emergency department. And, and when you decide to admit the patient in ICU, it's better to admit the patient as soon as possible, but really depends on the organization of the hospital. Because in some emergency department, you have a kind of small intensive care unit, you can manage the patient in the emergency department. So it's very country specific and, and, and even uh, hospital uh, specific organization. But yes, you, you, you need to, to decrease the delay uh, uh, as much as possible. Susanna, so what is your practice regarding the uh, discussion and the decision finding with your um, in emergency department regarding this question? So we would, um, we have an outreach team um, who would go and see the patients in um, the um, accident or in a &E, um, and make a decision and we would try to admit them as early as possible if they were for intensive care. But we also have a frailty team, interestingly, in um, most of the RIT, in our, most of our um, emergency departments as well, who sometimes get involved in these patients. What is important is to consider the uh, alternative to intensive care. So how the hospital is organized to, to cope with those old critically ill patients. So I, I spoke about intermediate care units, but also acute geriatric units. And I think those patients, if they are not admitted in, in intensive care, should be admitted in acute geriatric unit. So true, time is flying, Un unbelievable fast. Um, I would like to close the session. I would especially thank you, Susanna and Bertrand, for this uh, great talk and uh, also the wonderful discussion. Of course, I would like to thank uh, ESICM to give the opportunity to discuss this uh, important topic. But most importantly, I would like to thank you for your uh, participation and discussion via the chat. Um, have a wonderful evening, stay healthy, and see you hopefully soon. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you, Christian. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.